Welcome, regular Drews. Hello, everyone. We are here for episode 16, Smile and Say Murder. Case number four, The Nancy Drew Files. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so, and we hope you are too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to Regular Nancy Drew. So, yeah. What did you think of this one? I did not like it. You didn't like it? <laughs> I I mean, it was fine. It was fine. I was just bored. Really? I just, and I, I think part of that is because it felt very obvious to me what was going on from the okay. beginning. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, obviously, Nancy, like, catch up. And also, I was really annoyed by, like, the drama between Nancy and Ned. Because it didn't feel... It didn't feel very um, grounded in anything. It felt just like ridiculous, like outrage. I was like, "What? What yeah. is actually going on here?" And and it felt uncharacteristic of Nancy. And also, we didn't have Bess in this book or any of her other friends. And She's in it. okay, yeah, but like barely, like half a scene, but yeah. like a cameo, a cameo yeah. by Bess. And so I was just like, "Meh, not your thing." That's yeah. all right. Yeah. What about you? I will tell you, I've never taken this many notes in my life. <laughs> I have like double the, the amount of notes that I have for any of our previous wow. episodes. Just because there were so many things that were like, oh my gosh, there's a lot going on in this chapter. That's interesting because I took barely any notes. Really? <laughs> I, don't, I mean, it's probably because I was so bored. I was like, oh, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> I do agree that it was pretty obvious what's going yeah. on. And mm-hmm. the, mm, the very last chapter, the, not the ending, like with the culprit reveal and everything, that fine, whatever. The ending, ending, like our last scene. I mm. hate it. I hate it. Yeah. I hated yeah. it. I hate it. Awful. <laughs> yeah. It but we'll bad. get there. We'll get yeah, there. Yeah, we'll <laughs> talk about it for sure. For sure, we'll talk about it. A lot of facets to it. Yeah. Ugh. So, okay. three words. Magazines. Magazine. Yeah. Um, Chicago. Yeah. Chi Town. Yeah. And uh, pranks or yeah. sabotage or icky, icky stuff. Icky. I like that. Icky. Icky. <laughs> we'll go it's with icky. icky. <laughs> Magazine Chi Town Icky. <laughs> Number four, smile and say murder. <laughs> okay so this one was published in 1986 mm-hmm. and that's all i know about it yeah same same <laughs> the cover i think it feels different to me than a lot of the other covers that we've seen mm-hmm. i mean we definitely have kind of like the same like foreground background perspective situation mm-hmm. that's similar but I feel like Nancy is drawn almost like cartoonish a little bit in the cover yes. of this one. Like it's very, not that she looks like a cartoon, but her, like the, the lines and everything are much crisper and like she's, she's so much more like detailed, mm-hmm. I feel like than in the rest of them. It's a beautiful cover. I think the art is really well done. It's just, it's just interesting and different. Her outfit's fire. Too. Yes, yes. <laughs> Her outfit is fantastic on the cover of this one. Very professional. Mm-hmm. And a beautiful pendant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess we can get into the summary if you want. Absolutely. I will say I was so over this one when I finished it that I didn't bother to go back through and do like a summary. So oh, I don't blame you. <laughs> might be a little scattered on this one. I might have enough detail here, though. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Okay. There's, it's mostly question marks. <laughs> Just, what? <laughs> Why? <sighs> okay. Anyway. So, chapter one, our opening scene, Nancy is on a commuter train to Chicago. I'm sorry, but I cannot move past this until we discuss the fact that River Heights is, like, commuting distance from Chicago. They do. They specify it's an hour outside 
or like yes. a two hour train ride, like a one hour drive kind of situation. No, I think it's 45 minutes. She says 45 minutes by train. Oh, okay. An hour drive. Oh, okay. Okay. I've got that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, don't know I mean, two hours, but we can narrow this location down for real. We can. Anyway, I just needed to remark upon that <laughs> right off the bat. Anyway, Nancy's on a commuter train to Chicago because she is going to Flash Magazine, which apparently is this like super new, up and coming, very popular magazine that Bess is obsessed with, by the way. That's how Nancy knows about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's been asked there by Yvonne Verdi, who is the co-owner of this magazine, because she has been receiving threatening letters, basically, um, and she wants Nancy to come investigate. Once she gets off the train, she starts heading into the Flash building and on her way in, a few employees are walking out and they're gossiping about how how much they don't like Yvonne, how <laughs> she's mean, how she's not a great boss, how she's very temperamental. Not very many positive things are said. They also, this is kind of a little specific for our summary, but they also said specifically that she had like called them into her office or whatever to talk about their dress code. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was like, if, you know, she mentions like dress code to me one more time, like, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it, is what somebody was saying. I was like, yikes. Mm. <laughs> that is an awful thing for a boss. Is, yeah. I don't like that. Um, so she goes into the building. She goes up to a receptionist. The receptionist um, directs her to Yvonne's office and she meets Yvonne. And Yvonne, it's kind of, yeah, she kind of picks up on like this patronizing feel from Yvonne. Like she mm-hmm. always kinds of want, she kind of wants to uh, make it seem like she is in the know and she is better than you kind of <laughs> a thing. Yeah. And she shows Nancy the threatening letters that she has gotten and they're pretty intense. And she talks to Yvonne about them and Yvonne says that she thinks that they are coming from, or that she knows that they're coming from Mick, who is the co-owner of Flash. And she thinks that he is sending them because he thinks that she wants to sell this magazine to MediaCorp, um, who offered to buy it, Mm -hmm. but she actually doesn't. Um, She actually would not sell, and there is no price that she would sell this newspaper for because this newspaper is her baby, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And that Mick is just confused and losing it. She keeps saying that he's, like, flipped out, that he's, like, lost it or something is what Mm -hmm. she's implying. Uh, And so she calls Mick into the office because the cover, Nancy needs a cover for being there. And so she says, okay, well, you know, I'm going to make you uh, Mick's assistant. Mm -hmm. And so she calls Mick in there and she's like, hey, Mick, here's your new assistant, Nancy Drew. And he he does indeed flip out. (laughs) But I mean, kind of rightly so. So at first he's like very angry because why on earth would you hire an assistant for me? I didn't ask you to hire me an assistant and I should be responsible for hiring my own assistant. But uh, she's like, well, sorry, basically, here's Nancy. And so he gets so angry and they they shout at each other. They say terrible things to each other. And then he smashes a vase on her desk Mm -hmm. and storms out. Yuck. Woof. Mm -hmm. I do want to note here how impressed Nancy was by their quote unquote high tech offices that almost everyone had a computer and these <laughs> she she does uh, make a note of these threatening notes that they were they were printed notes not handwritten or anything so because of the the holes on the side of the paper she could determine that they were probably printed at one of the office computers so um, you know that's how high tech they were the the printer paper is like identifiable by the machine that it was used. used well, by. I don't know if you remember Corey, but like back in the day, like back mm. in the day, back in the day when we were probably we young ones, Infants. probably like <laughs> five, six years old or whatever, the printer paper, and this is new to all of our listeners as well. The printer paper that printed out had that perforation mm-hmm. on the side. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah. And so that's, yeah, that's what Nancy's remarking upon. She's mm. like, Oh, so this was printed. Yeah. It's a wild. <laughs> so that's what technology was like back in late eighties, early nineties. That mm-hmm. the printer needed special paper, and you could identify the paper from the, the printer that it came from. It's not just a universal thing. 
She also does make a note, and she asks Savan about it, that she sees a detective novel sitting on her desk. And she's like, oh, you know, you have a detective novel. That's great. Do you like detective stories? And Yvonne is like, oh, no, someone gave that to me. It was just a gift. I, I wouldn't read such trash, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. And, it's, and, it, and I think that moment is supposed to hit at the heart of all of us, because here we are reading basically a trashy detective novel. <laughs> like... And it's supposed to be like, excuse me, Yvonne. Right. (laughs) Detective novels are great. Um, But Nancy very sagely reserves her judgment and is like, oh, okay. (laughs) She does also tell us about David Bowers, who is her new employee that just came from her, came to her from, we don't know yet, right? I don't think she tells us yet. Wait, that's, is that her boyfriend? Yeah. I didn't think he was new or not that new, but maybe I misread that. She says that she graduated from college five years ago and recently, I don't know what recent means in this relation, came up with the idea for Flash. So recently she's come up with the idea for this magazine, launched it, got this whole building, got all the staff. I don't know. It just seems like a very quick timeline, but um, she's hired this new guy, David Bowers, and they've started dating. So I was confused about that, too. I was like, did they start dating before she hired him or did they start dating after she hired them? I don't know that it necessarily matters, but either way, it's kind of a huge red flag. (laughs) It sounded like after. I don't know. But he's editor in chief of the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. So Nancy starts after the incident with Mick smashing the vase. She starts to wonder if she is kind of in danger at this this internship. So she decides to call Ned. It mm, it's another spring break mystery. This one's <laughs> Ned's spring break as well. It's Ned's spring break, and she is supposed to go to his parents' lake cabin with them mm-hmm. for the week. Um, and calls to tell him that they cannot go anymore. She cannot go anymore because she's got this mystery, and she's wondering if he will help her. Well, I don't know. Actually, I think it's supposed to be she calls him because she needs the help at the the magazine and she kind of wants him for muscle or whatever right. to protect her and protect Yvonne. But when she calls him, Ned's like, oh, you know, are you ready to come up to the lake or whatever? And Nancy had like forgotten about this. Right. <laughs> And she doesn't actually say that she forgot, but she had forgotten. And she was right. just like, oh, yeah, I can't I can't go anymore. I'm busy. And in fact, you're busy too. Get your butt up here. It was just, it was honestly an awful moment for Nancy. Yeah. Um, and Ned is very upset about it. He is like, you know, like, what do you mean? This is my spring break. I wanted to relax. I wanted to hang out with you. I didn't want to, you know, have to be involved in another one of your mysteries, Nancy. <laughs> I wanted to take it easy. And she's like, Ned, this is more important. Someone's life is in danger. Uh, yada, yada, yada. And They kind of get into a little fight about it on the phone, but he, I guess, says, okay, well, I will. I'll be there. Mm -hmm. Poor, reliable Ned. For now. For now. For Mm -hmm. now. So she goes out into the office also, and she meets the receptionist named Scott, I believe, (laughs) who is playing Clone Wars on his computer. It's the 80s. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Wow. Um, He's working hard. Yeah. And so, you know, he, she talks to him about Yvonne a little bit. Uh, He tells her that he's an intern too. And he kind of directs her back to the the studio where she's going to be helping out Mick that day. Uh, But as she's walking down the hallway to that studio, who does she see, Corey? Brenda Carlton comes in. Brenda Carlton, our favorite River Heights 9 reporter. I don't Mm -hmm. think it's actually called River Heights 9 in the book, but. (laughs) Why is she in Chicago? But whatever. I don't know. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, if if River Heights is like a suburb of Chicago, basically Mm -hmm. like an hour away. Yeah. Chicago news is kind of relevant. So I don't know. Fair enough. I don't know. But so she sees Brenda, but Brenda doesn't see her. And so she like immediately like diverts and like ducks into the nearest office because she knows that if Brenda sees her, she'll blow her cover because right. Brenda hates Nancy. <laughs> and Nancy's trying to be incognito here. Mm-hmm. Um, so she like 
ducks into this office and she realizes that it's actually David Bauer's office, the editor in chief of this magazine. And she looks like the biggest dits, just like being like, oh, I thought this was the studio. Sorry. <laughs> And he's like, no, that would be the big door at the end of the hall that says studio on it. I know. Thanks. He was very rude to her. And he I was. was just like, this poor intern on her first day, and she goes into the wrong room, and you're just like, I, you know, you can read. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, Nancy is like, oh, sorry, I'll leave. And he's like, good. And she's like, okay, so that guy's awful. <laughs> Suspect number one. Suspect numero uno. Or Mick. So I guess two. (laughs) Um, And so she leaves and she goes down into the studio um, and she meets um, a pretty blonde girl who's hanging spiders from uh, like red and black spiders from like this backdrop. Um, And apparently this is Sandra, I believe. Sandra? Sandra Swanson. Yep. Swanson. Mix sister. Mix little sister. Mm-hmm. Nancy goes over to introduce herself and say, hey, I'm here to help you out with whatever Mick needs. And she right. offers to help Sandra hang these spiders. And Sandra's immediately rude to her. And it's like, mm, no, you go over there. Just yeah. go sit in the corner. I'll call <laughs> you if I need you. Like, right. Yeah. Um, and so, like, right after that, Mick comes into the office or comes into the studio and is like, what are you doing just standing there? Go help her hang the spiders. <laughs> and Nancy's like, OK, <laughs> she goes to go do that. The receptionist does come in and she meets one other intern and they tell her that Sandra thinks that she is just there to spy on Mick, that Yvonne has just hired her to be a spy, mm-hmm. which is kind of kind of true <laughs> yeah yeah um let's see so we also learn at this at this photo shoot that mick hates spiders he's like shuddering he's like creeped out by the gross rubber spiders and um his sister's like they're just rubber you know la, la, la. but they're there they're hanging up the spiders for this pop star who's there to do a photo shoot um and her let me see what is her latest thing called because that's why they got the spiders i I did not write it down i didn't either dang it anyway the spiders have something to do with this this chick's album or uh, song or something it's on theme Um, don't worry about it yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) and oh that's right so the the that's what i was thinking about the song the pop star's song her like famous single was a song that was mentioned in one of the threatening letters to Mm -hmm. Yvonne. And she catches Mick singing this song under his breath as he's like setting up his camera and stuff. Mm -hmm. Suspicious. Mm -hmm. Very Very suspicious. suspicious. But Nancy kind of shakes it off. He's like, well, she says, you know, this has been on the radio. So it could just be that it's stuck in his head. You know, lots of people know this song. So it's not exactly conclusive proof that he did or didn't write these writing letters right mick is rude to nancy again and Mm -hmm. asks her if she even knows anything about photography and nancy goes "Hmm. well actually she goes over and picks up the camera i took a summer class (laughs) and she starts educating everyone on cameras and photography and lenses and how you use the lenses and the best angle to take the photo at and just completely shows him up I do need to write this down as a Nancy skill. Yes, <laughs> photography. Yeah, add that to our list. So Nancy, while the photo shoot's going on, Nancy is kind of off to the side talking to the other interns, and they all agree that they do not like Yvonne, that she is rude to them, she's mean to everyone, and they one of them even says that anyone in this office would kill her if they had the chance. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, So after the photo shoot and everything wraps up, Mick asks Nancy to help take down the spiders and then go put them in the prop closet in the back. Um, And so Nancy takes the spiders and goes back into the closet at the very back. And there is like a hanging axe in midair over a floating head that I guess is like supposed to be like a a prop severed head Mm -hmm. 
But Nancy doesn't realize it's a, a prop at first. She just screams and runs out of the room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, like as she comes running out screaming, uh, Mick starts laughing hysterically and is like, ha ha ha, got you. You fell for it. Isn't that such a funny joke? <laughs> He's holding a remote control as well. Like the oh, axe right. was like remote controlled to be moving or whatever. So to like fall. Right. Um, right. Which is terrifying. <laughs> have like an axe like falling for your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not a practical joke. Not no. funny. Definitely not. And his little sister ends up getting on to him and being like, Mick, what the hell? That's not funny. And so uh, Nancy tries to brush it off. And is like, oh, you know, no, it's fine. But Sandra basically apologizes to her for this. And she's like, sorry about my brother. He's just a practical joker. He doesn't realize how terrible the thing that is to do. I'm sorry about that. And she also says he takes his jokes too far sometimes. Uh, I would say so. I would say so too. <laughs> but that's also just interesting as far as our mystery goes, right? Yes. Because these threatening letters, maybe they could be construed as a bad practical joke. So she starts to think a little bit after this happens. And she starts to remember that she's met David Bowers before, but she can't remember where. She thinks about it for a while and she realizes that she met him at Carson's office previously because he used to be the editor-in-chief for the Midwest Law Review, which is actually owned by Media Corp, the company that's trying to buy them out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a very important link. So then after this shoot, Mick asked Nancy to go with... Sandra? Oh, no, Danielle, um, another employee of Flash, to go into the dark room and develop the photos from that shoot. Mm. But it's interesting because he actually, like, expresses, like, concern for them. And he says, like, oh, you know, make sure you're careful. Like, there's a lot of chemicals in here and stuff. And if you start feeling woozy or anything, make sure you step out of the room and take right. a breather before you go back in. And Nancy was just like, that's just so odd after having been the subject of this like terrible practical joke that basically made me fear for my life. <laughs> and then suddenly see this caring side to Mick. And mm-hmm. so then she starts to like develop this theory that Mick could have split personality. <laughs> Which is some 80s psychology if I ever oh, heard Oh, I know. <laughs> um, That's yeah. not what that is, by the way. <laughs> nope. 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 Definitely not. I don't know if we said this. We both majored in psychology. so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we uh, originally considered having this podcast be uh, like diagnosing Nancy Drew. <laughs> and just um, basically, uh, you know diagnosing all the different characters <laughs> well i'm diagnosing mick right now and it's not, not- personality disorder which is now dissociative identity disorder but it would have been what would you what would you say Corey? not that <laughs> probably nothing yeah yeah maybe some slight anger issues oh yeah maybe yeah yeah, yeah. that's but not dsm-5 diagnosis no not a disorder level though yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, at the end of the day, she goes to talk to Yvonne. She asked her how her day went, went and she said, it's fine. But I saw Brenda Carlton here and she knows who I am. Um, and, and Yvonne says, like, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, she she isn't here that often or whatever. Um, and this is when she asks Yvonne if Ned can also be hired, quote unquote, to help kind of protect Yvonne. And she says, sure. <laughs> Um, And so Ned heads up into the building the next day. Or no, no, sorry. Just kidding. Same day. She's leaving work and he's outside. He comes to pick her up in Chicago. And she happily screams, Ned, and jumps into his arms. So sweet. And so, yeah, he says, you know, I came here to pick you up because you called me yesterday. And then he said that he was worried about their conversation um, because... (laughs) He was having horrible thoughts about Mick, you know, hurting her, which is mm-hmm. very sweet. And so as they drive home, they kind of talk about the case and everything. But is this when they get into an argument? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's, you know, talking about how, like, she goes on, you know, these dangerous cases all the time. And he's like, you know, we could be safe at my parents' cabin. 
And she says, you're just upset about missing your trip. And he says, no, I am upset because I wanted to spend time with you. And she says, I don't know. It seems like you're being selfish. Uh, A person's life might be in danger. Um, And he says, when you could be running around getting yourself killed by an art director with an ax to grind, Nancy, I don't think you appreciate me very much. And it's interesting. It's interesting, you know, because this is not a new argument. (laughs) No. Well, it might be because this is only book four. True. Okay, true. But it's not. This is an argument we've read a lot of in the past uh, Nancy Drew Files. Uh, So so uh, Ned ends that argument by saying, no other guy in the world would put up with this, Nancy. And sometimes I wonder why I do. Ouch. Uh, that is ouch. Those are ouchy words. <sighs> Ned Nickerson. Um, but honestly, fair. Fair. Yeah. I feel like that's fair this time. Other times I feel like that's not fair. I feel like this one's fair. Yeah. Anyway. He does still agree to help her though. Yes, so. he does. He does. So she goes back to work the next day, and Mick actually calls her into his office and apologizes to her for the quote-unquote practical joke the previous day. He actually feels bad about it, Um, and Nancy starts to kind of see him as a little bit more of a a human. She's like, wow, I did not expect an apology. I certainly didn't expect one that was so sincere. You know, I can kind of see where he was coming from with, with some of this, so... Maybe maybe he wasn't wrong to get upset at Yvonne for hiring this for hiring me as an assistant, but maybe there is this this dark side to him that mm-hmm. he just switches on and off. Mm-hmm. And so they talk a little bit more about uh, Yvonne and Media Corps and the issues that they're having with potentially selling the magazine. And so she asks him about Media Corps, and he said basically like. No, I would never let us sell this magazine. I would not let that happen. Mm-hmm. And he basically said, she asked him if he wouldn't hire anyone who once worked for Media Corps. And he says, no way. And so that's interesting because we know that David worked for Media Corps. Right. And so did he not tell them that he had worked for the law or the, for, yeah, the law review and Media Corps or what's going on there? Um, But she says she does say that Yvonne would have had to have known about David's background. And so she must be hiding his background from Mick. Right. Which is interesting information, especially like considering everything Yvonne has said about not wanting to sell. Right. Um, And then she notices uh, mystery novels on a shelf in Mick's office. And she is like, oh, you must be a fellow mystery lover. And Mick's like, yes. And... By the way, I discovered the Hardy Boys in grade school. What? Hold on. Me? Hold the phone. Yeah. Mm. It can't. No. How? How? They must Are not we... have decided yet to start the super mysteries. Because <laughs> I just don't understand how this, this works into the timeline. Major, a major fourth wall break. A oh, major yeah. one. What the hell? <laughs> how? It makes no sense to me. It doesn't. I feel like this is just a mistake. I mean, I, honestly, it was obviously it was a choice, but a bad one. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It makes zero sense. It really, yeah. Um, but I also mentioned Agatha Christie, which I thought was yes. great. That, was, that yes. one was a great call out. Yes. Um, I could see Nancy reading Agatha Christie, yeah. Sherlock Holmes. Sure. N- not the Hardy Boys. No. She even says that she read them as well, didn't she? That she was yes. a fan of theirs? Yeah, I always loved them too. That's what she said. So, if, Well, we know that you love the Hardy Boys, We know Boys, that you, Nancy. like, yeah, like, actually love them. Because you know them. Only part of the Stratemeyer Syndicate is existing in the Files universe. I guess so. I guess, apparently. yeah, we really have to, you know, revisit your time travel theory. Because I think that is just about the only way that this makes any sense. <laughs> Anyway, so um, he then asks Nancy to go help finish the layout for the magazine. And so she goes to do that. They end the conversation on a very good note. And as she goes out into the hallway, she sees Ned there, very, very close to someone at the reception desk. And she kind of walks forward. She sees that it's Sandra. And she they're like leaning close together and seem to be kind of flirting. And she is like, oh, so upset at this. Yeah. She is like, how 
dare they or how dare Sandra make a play for Ned? She says, like, I guess Sandra doesn't know any better, but Ned should know better. Yeah, than Ned to should be know better. With another girl. And so she's like about to walk up there and like put a stop to this, which is like insane. But then a piercing scream or two piercing screams cut through the morning calm. Dun, dun, dun. So Nancy has to run away really quickly. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even have time to deal with Ned. <sighs> Yeah, she recognizes the scream as being Yvonne's, and so she runs to her office, and Yvonne is freaked out because there is a huge, hairy black tarantula in her desk drawer. She also makes a note of everybody else because a lot of people like ran and followed her into the office from the scream. Mm -hmm. And Mick was there, and he was confused with what was going on, and David was there, but she says he surveyed the commotion impassively. Hmm. Interesting, weird, especially because your girlfriend's screaming. So wouldn't you be a little upset? (laughs) And so Nancy is like, oh, how did this get here? Yvonne's like, I don't know. And Nancy's like, oh, we should save the spider for evidence. And she goes to like put it in a cup. Um, But Yvonne is like, I am not going to leave that thing hanging around. And she picks up a book and squashes it. Mm -hmm. A tarantula. This is sad. This made me very yeah, upset. I didn't like that. I um, don't like spiders, and I did not like that. Yeah, no, same. But, like, that's awful. That's terrible. Yeah. Ma'am, there was no need. <laughs> there was no need. And also, like, she didn't have to, she didn't even have to be near it. Nancy was putting it into the cup. Like, Nancy right. was going to deal with it. But she put herself near it by killing it. To kill it. Ugh. <sighs> Ugh. Terrible. Mick runs in, she and Sandra argue about it because everyone is accusing Mick of having done this. And Sandra's like, how could you? This is so ridiculous. There's a line and you've crossed it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he says, are you crazy? I would never do something like this. I'd never go near a spider. And this tracks because... Yesterday at the studio during the shoot, there were all those rubber spiders and he was super icked out. He wouldn't even go near the rubber ones. Yeah. Right. Right. And so super, super strange. But she did remember, Nancy remembers that David had just come back from South America. And she Mm. happens to know that South America is a place where tarantulas are native to. Right. I thought that was hilarious because it's like, okay, but Nancy, he could have also just gotten it from like a pet store like right there he didn't bring it back on the plane with him for this moment <laughs> <laughs> but anyway Yvonne's shaken but she's okay Nancy tries to encourage her to go to the police at this point I, I guess because she thinks that someone she know she knows that tarantulas aren't dangerous but she thinks that maybe someone thought that they were and so she thinks that this is some kind of attempt on Yvonne's life <laughs> I don't know what the police would have done here. Like yeah. you, you found a spider. It is right. Chicago too. Like this is Chicago in the 1980s. Can you imagine what the police would have said about this? I don't. I stop wasting our time when you find a spider. <laughs> We're investigating five murders, so please excuse us. <laughs> Uh, Yvonne goes home, though. She's too shaken up by this. She goes home, and Nancy takes this as an opportunity to search everyone's offices. Mm -hmm. First, she checks Yvonne's. She checks the scene of the crime. Um, She doesn't really find anything until she gets down on her hands and knees to kind of look at the floor. And she finds a large white button that she recognizes having been from Mick's suit. Hmm. Hmm. And again, she says this is a small clue. It doesn't prove anything. Mick's been in and out of her office, I'm sure, all the time. So this could have come off of his suit at any point. Right. He was in there yesterday anyway with the vase smashing event. So Right, right. So she goes to talk to Mick. And she pretends to having have twisted her ankle because his floor is really slippery. <laughs> so she she pretends to like fall and twist her ankle and she's like, Oh, ouch. You know, like, Oh no. And she's like, Oh, I don't, I don't think it's too bad, but, but can you go get me some ice? (laughs) And he's like, Oh yeah, sure. I'll be right back. And he goes, and as he goes to get her some ice, she like frantically searches his desk and everything. Um, My favorite part of that was she goes, my dancer friend told me that's the best thing for the pain. (laughs) Ice on a swollen ankle. Really? 
Oh. You needed a, you needed a ballerina to tell you that. Okay. Groundbreaking. <laughs> it's this it's this fancy new treatment, Corey, called ice. Ice. It'll help the swelling. Anyway, anyway. sorry. Um, so she doesn't really find anything except on top of his desk. She does see a mystery novel uh, with the title "Deadly Potion, Deadly Bite" um, by an author named Ivan Green. Oh, and she says, oh, uh, that's so interesting. What a coincidence that Mick has a, a mystery book about a poisonous spider on the top of his desk right after, you know, there was just a spider left in Yvonne's office. Mm-hmm. But she has to sneak back to the chair, put her foot up before Mick comes back. Uh, she kind of sits there for a minute and then eventually gets back up. So this is where she goes to search David's office. Yeah, so she goes into David's office, finds a letter from MediaCorp on his desk, thanking him for his recent freelance work um, and referencing a check that they'd enclosed for his payment. Hmm, interesting. Nancy looks around. She can't find the check, but she assumes it must be a pretty big check if you're going to pay someone to bump off the competition. (laughs) That's her first assumption, is that this payment is to hiring him to do this. To be an assassin. (laughs) to bump off the owner of the magazine so they can buy it oh my gosh yeah no nancy's theories in this i just find to be like a little harebrained and and, well anyway we'll talk about it we'll talk about it later yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but yeah so let's see oh is this when they go to lunch Oh yeah. yeah, because she, uh, she and Ned are are like getting into an argument about Sandra. So mm-hmm. like she basically confronts him and is like, or Ned says, "We've got to talk." Like I, I know you, you've been avoiding me. Is it because of Sandra? And Nancy is just, she's like, "I can't talk to you about this right now. I have to go have lunch with Bess and George." But Nancy is like pissed, like capital mm-hmm. P pissed. She is upset with Ned. Um, and she has been avoiding him because he's been flirting with Sandra and she does not appreciate it. Right. Um, but yeah, so Bess and George are waiting. And so off she goes to lunch with them. But like all through lunch, she is, this is just really great and classic. She's just ranting oh, I love to her this girlfriend yes. about uh, how Ned's been flirting with Sandra and says that he is stepping out on her. Those are the words yes. that she uses, which I was mm-hmm. like, is he Nancy? Is, is he, he just... Pretending to flirt for the mystery to get information, or was he really flirting with her? We don't really know exactly what happened just yet. Mm -hmm. So I I was surprised at that point to hear that phrase specifically. It is a major assumption on Nancy's part, especially because she literally has not spoken to Ned about it. Like, she literally has not spoken to him. Like, she saw it happen, and then she's been avoiding him ever since. So, what? Right. Very strange. But yeah, there is, of course, a little best and food moment. Um, This one I didn't think was actually that fat shamey. No. Except for on the part of, like, the author. (laughs) I'm concerned about Bess, that there was some implied eating disorder here. Yeah. Yeah. Which might be the first time that's that's been there. Mm Mm-hmm. And it worried me because Bess, they say what Nancy and George ordered and, and Bess had a salad, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Bess is this, this, and oh, I, I'm too fat. And George is like, you're not fat. You're just lazy. Yeah. Bess is, just starts putting herself down and saying all these really negative things. Yeah. It's just. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting scene. Yeah. And we'll probably have to come back to it because there's oh, kind of we will. a lot to unpack. <laughs> But yeah, so she's having lunch with Bess and George, and George is like, you seem like you're really down, and that's so weird, because usually when you're on a case, you're super excited about it or whatever, and Nancy is like, so what's going on with Ned? <laughs> like, so what's going on with Ned? And she calls him old reliable, which I thought was hilarious, and yeah, Nancy's like, that's just it. She talks about Sandra, and oh, gosh. We say something about Daryl Gray. I'm trying to find it. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking of. So, yeah, Nancy says, like, yeah, I can't believe Ned's doing this. I mean, like, I've complained, like, when he's busy with sports and stuff, which there's also a football reference there. Mm -hmm. So uh, she talks about football season. So we have our confirmed answer that Ned does indeed play football and basketball. Um, But she says, I only complain. I don't ever do anything. Of course, there was Daryl Gray. 
But that was one time. What what was Daryl Gray? What happened against with Daryl Gray? If you're not familiar, he is from Secrets Can Kill, which is the first Nancy Drew file. Now we need to read that mm-hmm. because ASAP. Was it just flirting like we see in the game, or did something happen with Daryl Gray, Nancy? She implies that something happened. I imagine it's probably a kiss because that's probably about as steamy as we'll get in the Nancy Drew files. But she definitely implies that it was more it's yeah. followed right up with he's gone and forgotten Bess mm-hmm. insisted mm-hmm. forgotten oh ladies and there's something to forget apparently yeah yeah very interesting and so like very quickly they just like assume that ned is dating sandra and I was really confused by this because it seemed like just like a common fact now that, yeah, Ned is dating Sandra. I'm like, wait, how did we get here? Literally, all I saw was him standing next to her at a desk. Right. <laughs> I guess that's all it takes. But it doesn't stop there. Don't worry. We'll get more of this later. <laughs> um, but they kind of like laugh it off and, you know, she's happy to have talked to her friends about it. Um and um, then we learn that Bess is dating a rock star guitarist yes. who has been on the road named Alan Wales. When did that happen? We have got to read the beginning of the series because apparently there are some big, big things that develop. Bert and Dave are long gone, apparently, yes. because George is also dating someone new. Uh huh. Yeah, someone named John who she's going to go see this weekend. Like, wow. These ladies are out there. This is when I was like, wow, there's so much going on in this chapter. So (laughs) much juicy drama. And then this is like minimal compared to where it's going. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh, but I I love this scene. It was just, it was great getting Bess and George to cheer Nancy up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, Nancy heads back to the office. She works on picking out some pictures from the shoot they did the other day. And then suddenly she hears a gunshot ring out through the hallway and she runs out and everybody is running towards Yvonne's office. And so she follows and she's looking into Yvonne's office and she sees Yvonne in there and she, Yvonne suddenly faints. Mm-hmm. Falls like to the floor. As soon as everyone runs through the door. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because Nancy's very first thought when she sees this happen, she is like, dang it. I knew I should have called the police after the spider. <laughs> It's not, oh no, Yvonne, are you okay? It's, oh, I should have called the police last time. I just thought it was so funny. Um, But she runs over to Yvonne and checks her pulse and is like, she's alive. Mm -hmm. And she also was confused for a second because Yvonne's pulse isn't weak or faint. It's actually racing. Mm -hmm. That's weird for someone who supposedly just fainted. Very weird. Very weird. Add that to Nancy's skills. Can take pulse. Oh, yes. Can take. Can take pulse. Yep. Pulses. Can take a pulse. Can can take a pulse. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, and see, it's at this point. It's at this point. I was like, okay. Obviously, Nancy. Obviously, Nancy. Come on. We know who's, who's, who's doing this. We know who's mm-hmm. behind it. Right. So obvious. Anyway. And she's still coming up with the most... <laughs> out there theories <laughs> yeah it takes her takes her a little a few more chapters to get there but yeah uh, we'll, we'll go back to dissociative <laughs> identity disorder for a little while we'll go back to david we'll get there yeah we'll, we'll get, get there, there. <laughs> um and then yvonne sits up and nancy's like yvonne what happened we heard a gunshot and yvonne says yeah i i I guess I just fainted and she points to a bullet that is like in her in, embedded in the wooden paneling, like behind her desk. Lodged in the wall. Uh-huh. And so it's like, okay, I guess the gunman ran in here and shot at you and you fainted. So Nancy goes to check the exits, checks fire escape, but they don't see anybody. There's nobody in the stairway. And this is really confusing because it's like, how could a gunman have gotten away and out of this office so quickly without anybody seeing? Mm -hmm. because everybody else was running down the hall so the only other exit was the fire escape Mm -hmm. and so when nancy comes back into the office and yvonne is like resting on her couch and she explains that she saw a man a figure 
wearing dark clothes and a ski mask. And he pointed a gun at my head. I screamed. He shot. He ran away. And that's all she remembers. Mm -hmm. Um, And Nancy says, okay, well, now we need to call the police. (laughs) Finally. (laughs) Finally. And Yvonne's like, oh, I guess so. Um, And so Nancy calls the police. And the police come and are confused, too, I think. Nancy investigates a little bit before the police yeah. arrive. Yeah, yeah, because we notice that Mick is nowhere to be found. He's not in the office. He didn't follow everyone when they were running. But he's the only person that didn't come running down the hall. Right, right. Um, and so she's like, mm, this makes Mick look really bad. But also, whoever shot the gun obviously had really bad aim (laughs) because they were nowhere near Yvonne. And so she's like, okay, well, so this also points to Mick because, you know, not a hitman, right? This is an amateur with a grudge, right? That's what she says. So she says, like, oh, man, this really looks bad for Mick. But I really wish um, that more signs pointed to David because I don't want Mick to be guilty. I want David to be guilty because I don't like David, (laughs) what she says. Hilarious. But the officers come, they take some statements and everything. And Yvonne goes home to rest because she's freaked Mm. out, I guess. Um, and then an hour later, Mick comes back into the office and she's like, where have you been? And Mick's like, why? What's going on? And it's like, oh, nothing. Just a murder attempt. Someone tried to shoot Yvonne. Mm -hmm. And so Nancy is paying very close attention to how Mick reacts. She says he's an amazing actor um, because he seemed very shocked at what Mm -hmm. um, she had to say. And he's like, are you serious? This can't be real. And Nancy's like, what have you been doing? And he says, I've been shooting people's pictures on the streets interesting thing for a art director of a magazine to be spending his day doing whatever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so basically he, he doesn't have an alibi for this, this shooting. And he, he even says like, okay, funny joke, everybody funny. I get it. You pulled one over on me. Like I pull one over on y'all a lot of the time, but you fooled me, but very funny. You weren't serious. And they're like, no, look, here's the bullet hole. And Yvonne's <laughs> the wall. Um, and he is like, oh, geez. And then Brenda Carlton. <laughs> I think Nancy manages to avoid her again this time. Oh, no, this is. Um, or is this what we she have a whole her? scene with, with Mick? Oh, right. Yeah, right, right, okay. right, 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 right. So she goes to talk to Mick in his office. She waits until he goes into right. his office and she starts spying on him very, very slowly, opens the door so he doesn't hear and then peeks through the smallest of little cracks in the doorway and sees that he is pulling a revolver out of the bottom drawer of his desk and looking at it. And Nancy's like, not on my watch. (laughs) Flings the door open, tackles Mick. The gun goes off in the the scuffle and immediately the police burst in. Mm -hmm, Because the police were there. Yeah, they're still in the building from from getting the the bullet out, out of Yvonne's wall. And the officer goes, Nancy Drew, freeze. You're under arrest. Some fast assumption on the part. They, yeah, they are arresting her for murder before they even go over and see if Mick is He's okay. Dead. Also, like, is she holding the gun? Because it no. doesn't, I didn't think she was. I thought they were just fighting over it on the floor, basically. And so, anyway, anyway. I don't think she's holding it. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, he says, get your hands in the hair, air and don't touch that body because mick is immobile on the floor Mm -hmm. and she's like nancy's like oh no i've been they think i've murdered this guy and it's at this exact moment that brenda carlton walks into the office and with a smile on her face and says well isn't this just the scoop of the year i can just see the headlines amateur detective nancy drew murders top exec And then everyone's like, what? Nancy is a detective? You were hired to spy on everyone. (laughs) And now you've killed Mick. (laughs) And so Nancy is like, no, 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 no. This is just a massive misunderstanding. And Ned also comes running in after the shot and puts his arm around Sandra and is like, no, Nancy's right. This is a mistake. And he is like, comforting Sandra who's like very upset 
And Nancy gets so upset. She gets furious. She's mm-hmm. Like, I am being arrested for murder right now, and my boyfriend is comforting another woman. Mm-hmm. Ugh, man. <laughs> and so Nancy's getting super upset now, too. She's, like, almost starting to cry because Brenda's there, and she's blown her cover and embarrassed her and ned seems to have like abandoned her and isn't helping her is comforting another girl and now they're arresting her for murder and so she's like crying and being like no no mick is the one who tried to kill yvonne and i came in here you know so i'm pulling that out of the drawer and tackled him Sandra calls her a liar. She said, it's true, wasn't my fault. And Sandra said, Mick's not a murderer. And Nancy says, I, that I saw him pulling the gun out of his desk. Um, and then at this point, Mick wakes up and is like, oh, my head. <laughs> Can you guys keep it down? <laughs> um, and so everyone's like, oh, great, Mick, you're not dead. And then everyone says, like, you were just pulling a gun out of your desk. And Mick's like, yeah, but it wasn't mine. I don't own a gun. I don't know anything about shooting people. I just know how to shoot people on film. (laughs) I'm very confused about all this. There's no blood. He's not injured at all, but he collapses and they assume he's dead and don't even check his pulse. Don't look at him. Don't rush over to him. I don't understand. Yeah. It's really a bizarre, it's a bizarre scene. I mean, I assume we're supposed to believe that, like, as Nancy tackled him, he, like, hit his head on the floor or the desk or something as he was going down, and that's what knocked him unconscious. Um, but didn't kill him. No. If he'd been shot dead, you would see evidence of that. Yeah. There would be blood everywhere. Well, and also, like, if there was just one gunshot, like, there's no guarantee he's dead from one gunshot. Right. Go try right. to stop the bleeding, like... Even if he were bleeding everywhere. Yeah, go help him. Well, help no, him. haven't even acknowledged him. You're just like, he's dead. He's Write dead. him off. <laughs> Nancy, you're under arrest for his murder. But the officers are like, okay, well, you're both going to have to come down to the station. And Ned asks, hey, can you take Nancy's handcuffs off? And he's like, no, she's under arrest for murder. And Ned's like, nobody's been murdered here, officer. <laughs> And, and the officer to you. is like, oh, right. Right, sure. <laughs> Takes the handcuffs off her. It's hilarious. But they do take them both back to the station. And both both of them make statements and everything. And Nancy, Nancy calls Carson. Carson arrives in record time, mm-hmm. 45 minutes flat. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. This is where she says that it's 45 minutes or something like 45 minutes to an hour because she says, wow, he must have sped here right. to get here in just 45 minutes is what right. she Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they go over the afternoon again and again. And both Ned and Sandra are there because they're not in like a private room or anything. So Ned and Sandra came also. And that means she had to watch Ned comforting Sandra for the whole afternoon. And that mm-hmm. is what she's so upset about. Not that she's sitting at a police station and not that her coverage has been blown at her job, but that Ned is standing there with his arm around Sandra. Right. Anyway. Well, they do eventually come to the conclusion that Mick must be guilty of the attempt on Yvonne's life. So they start to arrest him for that. And he says, "Uh uh-uh, I am innocent. I am out of here. He tries to run for it. Yeah. The police were like, stop or we'll shoot. And Nancy's like, oh, no, they would never shoot a gun in a a crowded police station. So Uh she takes a chair and slides it down the aisle and he trips over it. Oh, and they trap him. Gosh. Anyway, so yeah, they arrest Mick, but like mm-hmm. as they're like dragging him down the hallway, he's like screaming, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. Very dramatic. Very, very <laughs> dramatic. And Sandra's <laughs> sobbing and crying, and Ned is like, It's okay, Sandra, don't cry. And Nancy and- goes over and confronts them. Yes. Yeah. She is like, what the hell, Ned? You're you're hugging her. I'm right here. Shouldn't you be worried about me? I've been through a lot today. I was just arrested. What is going on? Um, and Sandra is like, you mean you two are going out? And then she's like to Ned, wait, are you a spy too? And Nancy says, we were going out. But I guess Ned has other plans. And she... Mm-hmm storms out there carson's following her nancy no it's okay you're gonna be all right nancy 
Mm-hmm. He actually tells her that Ned is not such a bad guy and he really cares about her. Just just give him some time. He'll come around. Mm-hmm. And Nancy's like, no, I hate him. I never want to see him again. Yeah, Nancy says she hates him. I thought that was mm-hmm. intense. I know. And as they're, like, headed home, Nancy is, like, imagining them, like, going out to dinner and, like, going out dancing. And she's just miserable thinking about them going out with each other. And, yeah, and so this is when she kind of remembers, like, wait a second, how can Mick really be responsible for this? It seemed like everything was over, but... Yvonne's pulse was racing when she was supposed to have fainted. And why would Yvonne fake passing out? And how is it possible that the gunman came in and got away without anybody noticing? And so it just seems like Yvonne's hiding something. And Things aren't adding up. Right. And Nancy remembers that she thought that Yvonne was like weird and cocky when she first met her. And she rubbed mm-hmm. her the wrong way then too. And so... Also, she remembers that Mick had, like, expressed care for her about apologizing for the prank and everything and for expressing care about, you know, them making sure they're taking care of themselves when they're working around the chemicals in the dark room. And her ankle. Yeah. Right. And so she's like, okay, well, I'm going to come back tomorrow on a Saturday when no one is around to do some a little further investigating. Mm-hmm. So the next day, I have to mention this because we get a little mention of Hannah. Yes. Um, and Ned calls and to try to talk to Nancy and Nancy has Hannah tell him that she wasn't home and she tried not to cry, but a few tears escaped because she's just so upset about it. But she goes into the office and a security guard asked her to sign a visitor's book to get into the office. And so Nancy did that. And as she does, she flips back a couple pages to see who also signed the security book and mm-hmm. Yvonne had come into the office late Thursday night. Nancy makes a comment about how she Mm -hmm. must be a workaholic and go ahead and heads up the elevators. Mm -hmm. And she realizes that security didn't even ask her for an ID. And she's like, gosh, security is really lax in this building. They just let anybody, I could be anybody and they just let me go up. Not a good sign. No. And as she gets into the office, she remembers how Scott, the receptionist, was able to deactivate the security system. And so she knew how it worked. And all she had to do was deactivate the alarm. And she had the office all to herself. Picks the lock first, though. Oh, that's With her credit card. Yes. (laughs) She does pick the lock also to the office. So. No big deal. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, She goes into Mick's office and, you know, she's investigating there. Um, She decides to develop the film in his camera to basically prove his alibi. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, goes into the dark room, starts developing these prints. She's looking at them. And then she realizes that there is one picture that has a newsstand in it. And it's so clear that she can actually see the date on one of the newspapers. And so it's Friday, the day of uh, the shooting. And so she says, mm-hmm. okay, so I can prove that Mick took this picture on this day, but now I just have to verify the time. And so she looks at the shadow in the picture and goes down to this newsstand, finds this newsstand on this corner. And basically it's close enough to what time it is that and the time that Yvonne was supposedly shot at that she's Mm. able to see that the shadows match enough to where Mm. she can prove that Mick was on that street corner at that time. This is very clever. (laughs) It's some solid detective work. It's very clever. I don't know. I don't know how well it would work Mm. because I mean, shadows. Yes, it is easy to tell by time of day, but like morning or afternoon, not three 30 versus three 40, you know, like it's, I don't think the shadows would be noticeably different enough yeah. depending on the angle that you're standing at. And it the- does seem very like fluky because especially if you're in a city and like in Chicago. And so like, depending on like what street you're on or, and what direction that street is facing, like the whole street could be in shadow. Right. Yeah. So it's, I, I think it's possible, but I think it is very lucky. Mm-hmm. But it was very clever for her to even think of doing this in the right. first place. So yeah. Yeah. Solid detective work. Nancy. But she does, she does clear him of this crime. She alibis him. So she 
contacts the police and lets them know what she's found, and they let him go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, so Good job, Nancy. The next day, they're on the way to the city, and Nancy is on the train with both Bess and George, and they are there to go shopping, I think. Yeah, Bess and George are riding in with her for the day. They're going to go shopping, and then Nancy's going to go to work. Right, right, right. They talk about Ned a little bit more, and Nancy kind of admits a little bit that like she might be partly to blame for this situation because she wasn't paying as much attention to Ned as he wanted. And he like had expressed that to her. And so even though she was really mad at him and it was not excusable for him to do things, the things that he had done, whatever that was, um, she understands why he might have done that. Um, so I thought that was real big of Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily apologizing, but right. admitting a little bit, Uh, Owning a little bit of responsibility. Sure. But yeah. So they get to this city um, and Nancy says, like, I have no idea when I'm going to be done. So I can't head back with y'all. They wish her luck. (laughs) Nancy talks about how she has really great friends, even though she has a really rotten boyfriend. And I was like, hold on for a second. Haven't we established that Ned is no longer your boyfriend? He is your Mm ex-boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Because you hate him now. Because you hate him. And also when they were at the police station, you Sandra asked if we were dating. Yeah. And she says we were, but not anymore. Right. So uh, let's see. Well, she goes into Flash and does not get a warm welcome from everyone who thinks she's a spy. People that she had previously thought of as friends, which is kind of funny because it's only been a week, but whatever. The only person who does give her a warm welcome is Mick. Yeah, and so she does get a note, too, from Sandra apologizing and being oh, like, yeah. I'm really sorry about all the horrible things I said. I, you know, I hope you can forgive me and that we can straighten this out. So that's nice, too. But, yeah, Mick is super grateful for <laughs> her getting him out of jail, which uh, is true. Mm-hmm. And Nancy decides to go talk to Yvonne. Mm-hmm. And Yvonne is like, angry with her Mm. for not stopping the person who is trying to kill her basically because she has gotten Mick out of jail and Yvonne is convinced that Mick is the one who is uh, doing all this stuff and responsible for all of these things you let the number one suspect out of jail you were supposed to put him in jail Nancy what's wrong with you Nancy is like, well, no, I think all these reasons, it can't be Mick. Actually, I think that it might be David Bowers. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how could you? He loves me. He would never. Nancy, you're fired. Fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so Nancy's off the case. But luckily, we're still BFF with Mick now. And so Mick invites her to be his date to this award ceremony called the Maggie's. Yeah, we just cut to a week later to them heading to this award ceremony. Mm-hmm. And I think, so is Maggie supposed to be like magazines? Like Maggie? <gasps> it is definitely is. It definitely is, yes. That's awful. It's so horrible. <laughs> Y'all come up with a better name. The Maggie's? No. Anyway, so there is quite a bit of talk about Nancy's outfit. Yes. She is looking super fly in a gold dress and mm-hmm. like, all gold accessories and gold jewelry. She is like mm. golden from head to toe. Her little gold clutch and her little gold pumps. And she just looks very cute. And Classy. Mick thinks so as well. Mm-hmm. She also thinks Mick is looking pretty good mm-hmm. and compliments him too. Mm-hmm. He's wearing like a tux with tails and there's like leather tails. She thinks that's super hot. Mm-hmm. Uh, she doesn't say it like that, but I said it like that. Mm, she kind of says it like that. <laughs> she kind of says it like that. Mick, oh, there's also a moment where like Mick bites his lip and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I was confused by this. This like flirting that came out of nowhere because at the lunch with Bess and George earlier, Bess asked about Mick and Nancy's like, no, he's too old for you. But now she's changed her mind. He's not too old, but whatever. I don't know. I think he's supposed to be in his 20s. His little sister is 18. We specifically know that. Okay. But yeah, Nancy's also, I guess, supposed to be Sandra's age. And like considering what we know about Yvonne, like having just come out of college and Mm. starting this magazine, I'm assuming he's mid-20s. Just a guess. Okay. But 
anyway, late yeah, yeah, 20s. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so yeah, they're going to the Maggie Awards, and she is kind of worried because she knows that um, Ned is going to be there with Sandra awkward very awkward um so they go into the club where these awards are being Mm -hmm. held and she sees ned and sandra and they have to go up and say hello and it's weird and sandra compliments her on her dress and ned says nancy i've been trying to call you and nancy's like i've been busy excuse us we have to go find our seats in fact i'm gonna be busy for a long time Oh, Hi. yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. San, uh, Sandra also takes a point to tell Nancy that there's nothing going on between them and that she has the wrong idea. And Mick even, like, he's like, I don't want to get involved. This isn't the time or place for it. But, hey, maybe you should hear them out because maybe mm-hmm. there's there's more to it than what you think is going on. What you think is going on isn't what actually is going on. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of mm-hmm. strange. Yeah. We also see Yvonne there mm-hmm. with David. Um, and Nancy's just like, oh, they look cold and untrustworthy, <laughs> which I thought was a funny observation. And so they're sitting there watching the award ceremony and they're coming up for the award that Flash, the magazine, is being nominated for. And of course, they win. Um, we don't actually see what the award is that they're winning, which I was kind of annoyed for. I was like, mm. like, what is like, what is it? What do they win? Yeah. But Anyway, so they win, and Mick goes up on stage with Yvonne to accept the award. And as they are up there, right when they're standing up there about to start their thank you speech, a light, this is familiar, is it not, Corey? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A light cracks off from above them and falls down almost on top of them. Mm -hmm. But luckily, Yvonne jumps out of the way just in time. But Mick is not so lucky. Yeah, They say it, it just grazed him, although he broke his leg and like has a few other injuries from it. I thought I thought his um, his injuries were more significant than that. But yeah, here we go. Dislocated shoulder, broken leg, five stitches in his arm, assorted cuts and bruises. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't call that just grazing then. It it hit him. <laughs> it hit landed him on him. One and side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we cut to a scene in the hospital where, where Nancy is visiting Mick and they're talking about what happened. Mm-hmm. And Nancy gets him a remote control dune buggy, which I thought was really sweet and really cute, a really good gift. Um, because Oh, sorry. I was going to say, doesn't she investigate the light a little bit and sees that there's a remote control axe that cut the the oh. rope or whatever that was holding up the light? I think maybe she talks about that later. Okay, sorry. I was because, jumping ahead. No, you're good. because it re- But it really does just go straight from the light crashing down to the hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I didn't miss it. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she gives him a little toy because he has a bunch of toys in his office. Mm-hmm. And she, uh, yeah, she tells him about how she, the police found that the light didn't fall on its own, that there was a remote control device rigged to cut it. Mm-hmm. And a remote control device very similar to the remote control device used for the axe. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, I swear I didn't do it, Nancy. And she's like, yeah, no, I know. Don't worry about it. And she says, everyone thinks that the accident was meant for Yvonne. But Mick, what if it was meant for you? Oh, no, actually, Mick Mick is the one who says that. I think. Mm. And it's not Nancy. Mick is the one who brings up that theory. He says, I think. Oh, no, no. I got it backwards. I'm sorry. It is okay. Nancy. Okay. It is Nancy. I, I was confused. I read it wrong. It is Nancy who comes up with that theory. And she says, I think that other attempts on Yvonne were just meant to discredit you. And the killer is actually out to get you. Mm-hmm. Finally, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mick's like, well, who is it? And she says, I don't know. I, I think that Media Corps might be behind it so that they can buy the magazine cheaply. And she says, if it is Media Corps, then I think David is probably the one doing the dirty work. Um, you know, I saw a check in his, or I saw the invoice or whatever in his office. Mm-hmm. And it's just speculation, but I'm going to investigate more. Uh, and she brings up the fact that Yvonne says she wasn't going to sell regardless. And Mick says, but that's just what she says, Nancy. Believe me, she has a price. 
why would I lie to you? Mm. I am like, okay, come on, Nancy, Nancy come on. Nancy. <laughs> the answer is right in front of you. She does also see that Mick has a few mystery novels there in the hospital. And she's like, oh, that's nice. Did someone bring you those? And he's like, yeah, actually, Yvonne brought those to me. And Nancy's like, what? That's strange. She doesn't like mysteries. And he's like, what are you talking about? She loves mysteries. In fact, she actually loves mysteries so much that she used to write mystery novels back when we were in college. Huh. So interesting. And Nancy goes, wow, what an interesting factoid, Mick. Did she by any chance go by the pseudonym Ivan Green? Because she makes the connection that Ivan sounds an awful like like Yvonne. And Verdi is the Italian word for green. Yvonne Green, Ivan Verdi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's flipped, but yes. (laughs) (laughs) And so it's at this point she is like, aha, I've got it. Finally, I figured it out. And I'm like, Really? That's what it took, Nancy. (laughs) This is the clue that tips you over the edge. But okay. (laughs) So she goes because she needs help. She goes to call. She wants to call Bess and George, but they're too far away. And she realizes that she'll have to call Ned. Hmm. She's been avoiding him this whole time. She still has not answered his calls. Mm -hmm. But so she calls the magazine. She says, hi, I'd like to speak to Ned Nickerson. Ned picks up the phone and Ned's like, oh, Nancy, finally you called. I have so much to tell you. I, you know, I want to explain. Let me explain. And Nancy is like, hold it. I did not call you to talk about the sordid details of your relationship with Sandra. And Ned's like, what? what?" And Nancy cuts him off and is like, no, I had to talk to you about something more important. We've got to meet up. Stay there at Flash. I'll be there as fast as I can. I've solved the mystery. I need your help. There are two people who are responsible for this, and I need your help to catch them. She says that Mm -hmm. the two people responsible are David Bauer and Yvonne. She says, really, Mick's been the target the whole time, and that she'll explain to Ned when she gets to Flash. And he says, okay, Nancy, I love click. (laughs) Before he can finish. Ice cold, Nancy. So she gets there. It's like 530. So mostly everybody has left the office, thankfully. And right. So right before she had (laughs) gets to the office to just didn't say what store. Oh, Woolworths. Woolworths. Yep. So she stops into the Woolworths, (laughs) picks up a toy gun and then heads to the office building. And when she gets there, it's 530. So mostly everybody has left and she tracks down Ned. Well, who steps out when she sees Ned? That's Sandra. And Ned goes, Sandra Sandra insisted on coming. And Nancy's like, great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nancy like immediately starts to like get on Ned's case. You know, why would you invite her here or whatever? And (laughs) um, Sandra jumps in and she says, hold on. You both sound ridiculous. We have more important things to be doing right now. We're going to catch a murderer. And Ned, you know, you need to understand that Nancy probably has a really good reason for feeling jealous. And Nancy, you haven't let Ned say a word to you. You both, but you both need to talk about this later because Mm. we need to catch the person who's been trying to frame my brother. So she insists to Nancy, yeah, that nothing (laughs) is going on between her and Ned. And Nancy just accepts it. She's like, all right, sure. And then they just drop it. Mm-hmm. cool all right <laughs> oh okay i will say because we have to we'll have to talk about this later too because so Sh- sandra says ned i think you were using me to get back at nancy a little mm-hmm. bit and like her jealousy like stroked your ego basically and ned says i refuse to admit a thing but a tiny smile played at the corner of his lips this isn't a time for jokes ned Ugh. gross Anyway, so <laughs> um, so Nancy tells them her plan, gives him the little water pistol, and says, uh, <laughs> I'm going to go confront Yvonne and record her confession, and in 15 minutes, come out and save me, basically. Right. Start waving the gun. <laughs> yeah. So they, um, they hide in the dark room. 
uh, while Nancy goes to Yvonne's office. And she pushes the door open and Yvonne's not in there, um, but she knows she hasn't left because her door was unlocked. So Nancy is just sitting in there waiting. And then suddenly, like after 10 minutes, and Nancy's starting to get worried too because she told Ned and Sandra to wait 15 minutes. And if Yvonne doesn't show up, they'll blow the whole thing right. by jumping out. <clears throat> but Yvonne shows up. And Nancy is like, hey, Yvonne, great news. I've solved the case. And Yvonne is like, oh, wonderful. But Yvonne is like, not happy. <laughs> so Nancy said, uh, Yvonne says, okay, we'll go ahead and sit down and tell me about it. And so she starts to say, oh, you know, uh, I didn't think I was able to crack it. But thanks to Agatha Christie, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, mystery writers, I did. Um, and then Yvonne's face starts to drop and Nancy goes, yeah, I've gotten a ton of ideas from books and I found that criminals sometimes get their advice or their ideas from books too. And she says, have you ever heard of Ivan Green, Yvonne? Um, and right as she is about to confront her, Yv Yvonne pulls out a revolver, points it straight at Nancy, starts smiling evilly at her da, da, da. Says, let's go nancy mm -hmm. don't make a sound nancy has a tape recorder in her purse oh, this yes. whole time yvonne yes. goes over and takes the tape recorder and turns yes. it off She's like oh this trick in the book you thought you would get me <laughs> mm -hmm. she takes the tape out of the tape recorder because this is back when tape recorders had actual tapes in them mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're smart nancy but you're not smart enough um, and she says, by the way, someone left the door of the dark room open and I made sure it was locked from the outside before I came in here. And Nancy is like, oh, no, my backup plan. <laughs> Shoot. Ruined. And she says, and in just a minute, you're going to join your friends in there and I will dispose of all of you. But I want to know how you guessed my secret. I thought my crime was perfect. And she says... Uh, the most, the biggest tell was that you lied to me about the mystery dolls. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah. They talk about the book on Mick's desk and Yvonne was like, yeah, that was supposed to make you suspect Mick, not me. And she was like, I figured out the, you know, Ivan, Yvonne situation. Mm -hmm. And she also talks about her pulse, mm -hmm. uh, having checked her pulse and that it was racing when she was supposed to have been fainted. And yeah, then Nancy asks her, well, how did you pull off the shooting in your office? There's no way you could have shot the gun and then planted it in Mick's office. And then she says, it was rather ingenious, wasn't it? She shot the bullet into the wall on Thursday when she was there late that night and also planted a gun in Mick's desk that night. But then on Friday, she used a second gun and shot out of the window and hid that one in her purse. And then when she went home, she took that gun home so no one would find it. And then, you know, Nancy says, okay, well, how does David fit into this? And Yvonne is like, David, uh, he's too stupid to pull off something like this. <laughs> I was just using him to get to the people at Media Corps. I did this, Nancy Drew, with no help from anyone. All by myself. You finally got your, your plot twist where it's the woman. And mm -hmm. not, not the evil mm -hmm. man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's so, okay. So it's actually at this point that Yvonne takes the tape out of Nancy's pocket because I, she does get that bit on oh, tape. Oh, okay. I remember. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But so, yeah, Nancy goes to, shoves her into the dark room with Sandra and Ned and has them tie each other up, mm. like really tightly, like at gunpoint. And then she ties up Nancy. And she says, I hate to spoil this party, so I'll leave. But first, I have to fix you some refreshments. And she pulls out all the chemicals in the dark room and, like, mixes them together in a bucket. Mm -hmm. And, like... Starts splashing the bucket everywhere. Right. And then, like, she says, this stuff is going to light up, like, desert brush in the dry season. And she puts the tape on the the center of the table in the room and she goes to like light a match. She lights a match, drops it on the chemicals, leaves and locks the door to the dark room. Mm -hmm. So the room's on fire yeah. has indeed gone up like dry brush in the desert mm -hmm. and they are 
tied. Yeah. So basically what happens is Nancy is able to untie Sandra's hands that are bound behind her back with her teeth enough so that Sandra can get her wrists out Mm -hmm. and they are, you know, managed to untie each other. But like at this point, the door is locked. There's no other way to get out. The fire is like roaring and Sandra like collapses on the floor because of the smoke. Mm -hmm. And so they're like freaking out. Okay. Like, what do we do? But then the wall collapses because Mm -hmm. of the fire is so intense right. that it like breaks down the wall into the studio. And there's this moment where Nancy is like, uh, or like, how are we going to get out of here? But they get some water from the sink mm-hmm. and they like splash it onto the fire to make enough of a path to where Ned can carry Sandra out. Nancy grabs the tape and goes to follow them. But Ned is very sweet. He's like, I'm not going to leave you, Nancy. And Nancy is like, Ned, the room is on fire. Get her out <laughs> of here. And so he does. <sighs> the fu- I swear. So they get into the next room and they're like, I guess, more safe from this fire. And they both like kind of collapse on the floor a little bit. And <laughs> so Sandra, I think at this point, gets out safely nancy asks is sandra okay and then she's fine we're all fine you know thanks to you keeping a cool head basically and nancy goes um ned i'd love to stay with you like this they're like both like collapsed on the floor she's like but the office is on fire you know <laughs> so good. i can't believe the building didn't go up in flames even faster i don't understand that because the wall collapsed right. like the wall of the dark room collapsed that to, to like have that happen the whole the room, structure well, yeah like the structure of the room would have had to have been to the point where walls were crumbling so the fire would have had to have been so intense in that room how on earth did they survive that how on earth would they not pass out right well, yeah, the smoke for one, but also I have to assume they're in like a really tall high rise skyscraper in Chicago. If the wall is falling down, the ceiling is falling down. I'm sorry, yeah. but like they can't be the top fo- unless they're the top floor and in, in, yeah. in which case they're just fine. But yeah. probably not, you know, the probably the whole friggin' thing's compromised now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Scary. Anyway, <sighs> they're able to get out of the building. Everybody's fine. Nobody has to go to the hospital for smoke inhalation. I don't understand that one. No. But they do. They're fine. And then we cut to the worst chapter. Yes, they are at the lake, you know, relaxing for the rest of their spring break, I guess. Also, so they specifically mentioned that they are at Fox Lake. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I was so annoyed because I was like, this was the perfect opportunity to do a callback to Sylvan Lake. Mm, yeah. Why on earth? Like even in Why not? like or Moon Lake or Moon Lake, and even in the Nancy Drew detective movie, Ned's family has a lake house on Sylvan Lake. Oh yeah, of so, course. So it should have been there. Should have been Sylvan Lake. Anyway, it's not. Some place called Fox Lake. Whatever. And Ned and Nancy are talking. And they're laughing, you know, they're sunbathing next to the lake. And Ned's like, oh, you know, our whole ridiculous fight wouldn't have happened if we had just come on this vacation from the beginning. And Nancy's like, I'm sorry, I'm a workaholic when it comes to mysteries. I know it's crazy, but either love me or leave me. And Ned's like, no way. Now that I've got you back, I'm hanging on to you. I have to put up with your obsession with mystery work. For another four books. <laughs> and yeah, I swear leaving you behind in that burning dark room was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And um, Nancy makes a joke about football. And Nancy says, well, I certainly learned my lesson. If I want you to understand how much I love you, I've got to show it. And she kisses him and says, like this. And there's no time but the present to start. And she kisses him again. And Ned's like, oh, don't let my parents see us. They'll get embarrassed. <laughs> it's, just, it's It is really awful. It's cheesy and it's gross. Horrible. And not in like a good way. No. <laughs> no. 
it doesn't feel right after all that to see them Mm -mm. like this. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. And we get like, we talk about Sandra a little bit and Ned says, I told you we only kissed each other once. So something did happen and it was exactly what Nancy thought. Right. Right. So it wasn't him just, oh, I was flirting for the mystery to like make her think and get her to open up to me and tell me secret. No, he actually did this. He really was cheating on her and then Mm -hmm. was like, Nancy, it's not what you think. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about, Ned? And Mick and Sonia, they all said that. They all were like, it's not what it looks like. It's exactly what it looked like. (laughs) And then later when Sandra was like, oh, you have a girlfriend, then it stopped. It wasn't like Nancy misconstrued it. No, he really was doing this because he was mad at Nancy. Yeah. And tried to make it her fault. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. oh, if you'd paid more attention to me, I wouldn't have been making out with Sandra. Mm-hmm. And Nancy saying that, like, she learned that to, like, basically to keep his love at attention, she had to show him physical affection by, like, mm. kissing him all the time. Excuse me? WTF. Gross. 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 Mm. <laughs> anyway. So he was stepping out on Nancy. That wasn't too much was. of an exaggeration. No, no. So, you know, they talk about the resolution to the mystery and anything about Yvonne. And Nancy was able to save the tape from the burning burning room. So mm-hmm. she was arrested because she's in jail now. Everybody at the magazine is friends with Nancy again. Yes. <laughs> Apparently, because that was important to mention in our resolution. Of course. And um, Mick is going to get the chance to run Flash his own way. Is not selling to Media Corps. Um, and David resigned is probably going back to work for the Midwestern Law Review. (laughs) Yes. And she's friends with Sandra now as Mm -hmm. well. They're going to go out to dinner. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Funny. They do also mention that Flash was only damaged in the dark room and then one wall of Mick's office, but otherwise it's totally fine. So they're reopened. Don't worry about it. They also mention that Mick offered to put Nancy on the cover of Flash (laughs) as like a, you know, world's greatest detective, Nancy Drew. But Nancy turned him down because it would be too much attention when she yes. tries to, uh, it would like basically preemptively blow her cover for any future cases she might have. She'd be too recognizable <laughs> as the world's greatest detective. Oh my God. Uh, <sighs> so that's so my yeah. on say murder. Mm-hmm. Where do we want to start? <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I just hated it so much. I just, I was so bored. And I just, it was, it just felt, it just felt really, all of it felt very uncharacteristic of Nancy. Yeah, it did. It did not feel like reading Nancy. It felt like reading some other detective as the lead. And I think that's why I didn't like it so much. And I, at first I was really excited because I was like, okay, interesting big city Chicago versus River Heights, but River Heights is supposed to be really close to Chicago. So I was thinking, okay, so maybe we're going to see all of our River Heights cast and crew in the big city. Like maybe we'll get like, you know, our favorite characters in a different context, but Mm -hmm. really the only characters that centered around were Nancy and Ned and they were fighting the whole time. Yeah. And I didn't Um, like that. And not, not in a good reasonable way and not in a way that made sense, but like where both of them were acting like really awful people to each other and they weren't communicating and we didn't know what was going on. And like, we were just getting this reactionary Nancy and the skeevy Ned and Nancy is not reactionary and Ned is not skeevy. Like, Those are like antithesis to the characters that we know. Nancy is calm, cool, and level-headed. And Ned is Mr. Reliable. So it's just, I didn't enjoy it. But She's also unobservant. She's a little clumsy in this. She does feel like a different Nancy from the mystery stories. When the, the obvious culprit to the mystery is so obvious. Like... It's like, Nancy, obviously Yvonne hired you because she didn't want to go to the police. She needed someone to be able to prove the guilt of Mick that she could control a young girl. Like, obviously, Mm -hmm. like you should have picked that up, like from the first time you met her, that she was shady. I picked up the shadiness the first time we met her and confirmed my suspicions by the time we find the spider poison book. Right. So one of the first things that I picked up on was that... 
there was tokenism in this book with one black character mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's only mentioned like in one scene and she never returns. And just there to say, Nancy met a nice black employee of Flash and they talked in the kitchen. Cool. That was it. That's it. Great. Just worth mentioning. Yes. Uh, everybody else is white, as far as I know. <laughs> or green, in Yvonne's case. Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't mention the race, except to call up the token character. Right, 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 right. Everybody else is just assumed white. Assumed white. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Bess's weight conversation? Yes. So... They yeah, are at the restaurant. They talk about what Nancy and George ordering lasagna and Bess orders a low-cal green salad. And Bess says, you guys are so lucky you can order whatever you want and never gain an ounce while I eat nothing but salad and look like a horse. George cut into her lasagna. Bess, you are not fat. Lazy, yes, but positively, definitely not fat. I don't know why you're so obsessed with your weight. Easy for you to say super athlete. You probably work off calories just thinking about your early morning jogs. Best stabbed a slice of cucumber and stuffed it into her mouth. Hmm. And then George laughs. Mm -hmm. George laughs. Yeah, George laughs. That's a good note. <laughs> so this is interesting because definitely this kind of flips the script. And I do think there have been lots of moments in the files where the narrator tries to show that Bess is obsessed with her weight mm -hmm. and they talk a lot about her dieting and, you know, she talks a lot about it. But typically whenever we read that, we read also some fat shaming from George yes. or some kind of poking fun at Bess for being like this, not just like an observation of that, which is what this scene seems to be, mm -hmm. but like some like actual like Bess, you're you're being stupid or best you're you are fat basically well that's what um that's when we very first go into the restaurant where do you want to eat best ass i'm starved george says i thought you were yeah. on a diet and she goes i am that's why i'm so hungry oh best yes. eat i hate that yeah yeah that's awful feel like you have to restrict your diet because your friend runs a lot yeah, that you have to starve yourself to fit in with your quote unquote naturally thin friends mm -hmm. or, you know, just having some kind of body dysmorphia where you think that you are massively bigger than them. And so, yeah, it's so awful. Sad. It is sad. It's very sad for Bess. And it's something that it feels like they pay such it's, it's in every single book, it feels yeah. like. Every single book that Bess is in, and even books where she doesn't really feature, she's just a cameo, like, we have to discuss the fact that Bess is like this. Yes. And it just feels, one, really egregious. Like, why do we have to talk about this? Unless you were trying to call this out, like, this behavior out as something, but they don't spend any time classing this behavior as bad or unusual they make it her only or, personality trait. it's her personality trait yeah right. her terrible. only personality trait besides being flirty which is just crazy to me because we've seen time and time again i say time and time again we see a lot of situations where best puts herself out there for her friends like mm -hmm. she is incredibly brave she make like they make her seem they tell her all the time that she's this big scaredy cat, but she's the only one who seems to like jump in to save people. She doesn't hesitate. If her friends she are in trouble, Bess puts herself at risk before she lets anything bad happen. There are like so many good qualities to Bess. She's hilarious. She, she may be funny. boy crazy, but like that's, that's not a bad thing. That that's could be, fine. that's a fine <laughs> trait, but like, yeah, I'm just so over this. Bess is boy crazy and weight obsessed and is only interested in fashion. Um, and these are all somehow negative things for girls to be. I just, I am just over it. I'm just over it. This, this kind of attitude and self-talk, it just all feels eating disorder to me. And I hate that that's yeah, what they've yeah. done to her. Yeah. I mean, like it could be like a legit, a legit PSA if they spent any time like oh, being yeah. like best talking about her struggle, like best saying, yeah, I'm trying to get better at this or I I'm done doing this. Or, you know, sometimes I really struggle with this. 
and making it about like Bess's like personal decisions right. <laughs> and personal growth and, you know, trying to show her like taking ownership and, and making steps to help herself. Right. Um, or even have her friends help her or like make positive comments instead of just laughing at her when, you know, she makes jokes about her weight and, and poking fun at how many diets she takes. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Reading this, it's just so clear to me that this is causing Bess a lot of emotional pain and mm-hmm. they're making it a trope. Mm-hmm. It's funny. It's something that we have to have in every book is our, there's our, there's our best joke there. Here's how we introduce her. Yeah. She eats too much apparently, but also not at all or too little, or she'll need cucumbers for lunch. Mm-hmm. She's also like, five pounds uh, heavier than perfect. Right. And yeah. So yeah, best deserves better. Hashtag team best. Yes. The name of this show is actually uh, regular best Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> we should also make a hashtag best deserves better. <laughs> best deserves better. She does. <laughs> At least George is actually like best. You're not fat. Right. He immediately calls her lazy afterward, which doesn't yeah. imply good things either, but Um, At least there's that. It's the only time we've gotten (laughs) that. Usually it's like, yeah, Bess, you do need the diet. Like, Mm -hmm. Do you remember the weighing scene in the um, Nancy Drew Mysteries, the one in the Amish country, the witch (gasps) witch trees? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the barn, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Yikes. No, yikes. Yikes. Big yikes. They, They do make a big deal also about talking about kind of George's body and we don't typically talk about this. We don't talk about kind of the flip side, but they talk about George's body a lot as being toned and athletic and, or trim, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and always in contrast to best. And, and so we're supposed to read these two as opposites, but it's just so flipping annoying to have to one, always compare women to each other physically, Mm -hmm. And to talk about like their weight in terms of like opposites, like fat versus thin, like, like, why is it, why is it needed to like make that like contrasting qualities with these women? Like, why do we discuss that? We don't, it's not relevant. It literally means nothing. Like you can just as well talk about how, you know, George has these like athletic tendencies, you know, is an athlete or whatever without discussing her body. Right. And we can talk about, you know, Bess's obsession with food too, whatever, without discussing her body. Right. Like the, that is not a requirement. <laughs> so um, I just find it, I just find it super annoying, but what can you do? Annoying. It's disappointing and disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Honestly, those are most of my comments. All of mine are just Ned and sad face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mentioned that he plays football as well as basketball. That's what I mean. It's like, while there's really like gross stuff in this book, it like doesn't make enough sense to be able to like comment on. It's just like, Nancy's being irrational. It doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Ned is being creepy and gross and skeeving on this other girl while Nancy is right there and apparently does kiss her or whatever while he's dating Nancy. Like, these just don't seem like the characters that we know. And no. how am I supposed to, like, make commentary on this book when it doesn't feel like it belongs with the rest of them? Right. It's just, it's disappointing. Maybe the files had some trouble finding their footing at first. And, it's true. You know, maybe this is just a, a side effect of it being an earlier one in the series. Yeah, that is a great, that is a great observation for you. Great, great cogent point. <laughs> well, I wonder if uh, Secrets Can Kill is going to be kind of like that, though, too. It makes me kind of mm. nervous. Well, I I am more interested in reading that one because I believe that Ned is not in it. Okay. I think, I'm pretty sure that Ned's not in it because of the references to Daryl Gray. Surely Nancy wouldn't be doing what Ned's doing in this book and flirting with another guy while Ned is right there. I don't think he is in it. Although Bess and George might be in it. I'm not sure. I don't, yeah, I I really don't know. But I, I, 
if Ned isn't in, I feel that's what that's the thing is. I feel like the biggest mistake that the Nancy Drew Files makes is what feels like falsely creating this drama between Ned and Nancy in such like an over the top way. Right. Like I think there could be a like legitimate way to do it and even a legitimate way to do it early in the files and kind of get it out of the way. Right. right? Establishing like Ned and Nancy have this problem. It's that Ned doesn't feel paid attention to and feels underappreciated. And Nancy, you know, thinks that Ned isn't supportive and doesn't help her with her mysteries. Like she feels like he should and, and have that be established and even have them have on and off again relationship without making it so freaking dramatic and uncharacteristic of the two of them. I just feel like it's sloppy and I get, I get that it's supposed to be this soapy book, but it just doesn't feel like Ned and Nancy. Right. It just doesn't feel like Ned and Nancy. And I I think there's a better way to have done it. And also I think like, if you're going to do it, do it and drop it and move on. Mm -hmm. But they wanted this on and off again thing. And I just feel like. It's exhausting to me. I don't think that. Nancy Drew Mystery Stories, Nancy, would have Mm. put up with such a tumultuous relationship. She would have wanted someone a little bit more dependable who's not going to flip out every time she asks for help or can't Mm -hmm. do something because of the mystery. And yes, obviously it's reasonable for Ned to expect Nancy to stick with her commitments and go to the lake house when she said she was going to go to the lake house. But going and cheating on her immediately afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It just felt like unnecessary drama. You're right. There's so much other drama going on in this. We really Mm -hmm. didn't need it. It felt contrived Mm -hmm. for no reason. Right. Like Ned could have just as easily not been in this book at all. And it would have been better. Right. (laughs) So Less icky, like we said. Less icky. (laughs) Um, But yeah, no, I agree. I think like Nancy Drew of the mystery stories is someone who is just like so much more... Like, she plays her cards closer to the chest. And I think we've talked Mm -hmm. about this before, about, like, how the Nancy Drew Files are, like, a little bit more feminist because Nancy more openly expresses her opinion. But I think that in the Nancy Drew Files, had Nancy been able to express her opinion, her opinion would have been, like, you know, yeah, one, I'm not going to, you know, waste my time with someone who doesn't value the things that I do the way that I do Mm -hmm. and also like still maintain that like she's gonna use people to her advantage right like I I I find Nancy Drew to be a very admirable person but also like she knows how to get what she wants out of a situation (laughs) she does she knows how to play on people's feelings slightly like manipulate people to get them into a situation where they'll help her or give her certain information she does it all the time and it's not selfish it's all for the mystery it's for a reason it's for a purpose um i don't yeah i don't think it's negative at all but like in the nancy drew files it doesn't feel like she has that ability it feels like her actions in these books it feels like she can't control her emotions right and then that impacts how she behaves around people Mm -hmm. like you know ned flirting with sandra in the nancy drew files or in the nancy drew mystery stories if nancy came up to a guy that she had dated um or was dating right and he was flirting with someone else nancy wouldn't waste her time getting angry with that nancy would probably leave the situation right maybe you know talk to that person later and be like i don't think we should see each other anymore but like she wouldn't feel like she has to go in and break them up or explain herself in any way like she could just get on with it you know what i mean right it just yeah it doesn't feel she wouldn't waste her time on this she wouldn't waste her time she would she would know when it was used like useful and when it wasn't Right. Oh, Nancy. <sighs> so, yeah. All right. Should we do our flashlight rating? Or do you yeah, have anything else? Mine's two out of five. Two out I, of five? Okay. I just, I just don't like it. I guess I'll give it two instead of just one because I don't know why. Because I feel like it's better than some of the Nancy Drew mysteries. Okay. Um, 
because it, at least it's not like at least the mystery itself like the plot you know and Yvonne's motivations and everything at least that makes sense right like at least that is grounded in some kind of reality and is like explainable right it's not crocodile island and, right <laughs> right um so two two out of five two. yeah I'll probably give it a three. I did like the whole plot line with Yvonne and and Mick. It probably would have gotten a lot more flashlights had the whole Ned drama not happened. Right. That definitely brought it down a lot for me, but it wasn't my least favorite, but it definitely could have been a lot better. What is, what was your least favorite Nancy Drew file? Oh, I don't know. Gosh, what have we done? Let's see. Well, honestly, this is probably the lowest rated one that we've. True. That one I've given. I think I've given all of them a four or five, or four and a half. So maybe this was my least favorite. But <laughs> even then, so, I'm not saying that I hated it or anything. We did Stay Tuned for Danger, Two Points to Murder. You might have disliked Two Points to Murder more. Okay, maybe. <laughs> um, Tall, Dark, and Deadly. Oh, it's Tall, Dark, and Deadly was so good. Suspect, Suspect next, door. next Door. And Shockwaves, yeah. I loved Shockwaves. Shockwaves, <laughs> definitely the best one. Definitely the best one. Yes. Oh, yeah. so good. But, you know, we're not done with the Nancy Drew Files. We still have a few more to do. Yeah, and we're not done with Chicago either. We definitely are not, because our very next Nancy Drew File to cover is, drumroll, case number 51, A Model Crime. And I'll just read the back of this one really quick. Go ahead. A major modeling agency, a designer clothes company, and a popular teen magazine promised to make one girl's dream come true. All are sponsors of the Face of the Year contest, and Bess is a finalist. With Nancy at her side, she's off to Chicago to seek the fame and fortune that awaits the winner. But the competition is fierce, and deceit proves to be the hottest fashion of all. A desperate campaign of dirty tricks has brought the contest face-to-face with disaster and scandal, and the spotlight falls on Nancy as she tries to unmask the cover girl cover-up. <laughs> Wait, does the spotlight actually fall on Nancy? Because that would we'll be the have third. To see. <laughs> we'll have to see. If anything happens to Bess, I will burn it all down. I will set this book on fire. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay, I'm ready for this one. I am ready for this one. Also because it features Bess. Um, I'm just so excited. I, I just love Bess so much. I'm so ready to mm-hmm. read a book where she seems like she is the star. And is getting the proper accolades for what she deserves. Yes. Yeah. Very excited. Are you excited? We'll see you then, regular Drews. We'll see you next time. But since this is our first episode of the month, don't forget to head on over to our social media accounts tomorrow for our extra spooky October puzzle. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at Regular Nancy Drew and Twitter at Regular ND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $1 level receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks for listening. <laughs>